Um, good afternoon, uh, media colleagues. I'm Michael Bachurk here, the spokesperson for the OSCE Special Monitoring Mission to Ukraine. And uh, with me is the distinguished Honorable <laughs> Ambassador Apakan, the Chief Monitor of the Special Monitoring Mission. Uh, we do apologize, the, uh, uh, as often happens, the uh, PC Permanent Council went slightly over, and Ambassador Apakan has a very tight schedule of bilateral meetings and other briefings. So um, if you allow, he will read a uh, short condensed statement, and then I'll be happy to take uh, as many questions as you'd like. So uh, on that, I'll pass the floor over to the Honorable Ambassador. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, dear friends, dear colleagues, for, for your attendance here today. You know, it's always useful to meet you whenever I come uh, to Vienna for reporting to the Permanent Council. And I just came out from the Permanent Council discussion and completed my sixth, sixth report to the Permanent Council. I thank our participating states for seconding monitors. Many have also kindly provided assets, such as armored vehicles. Recently, the Permanent Council gave me the flexibility to increase the number of monitors. And we have, at the moment, 444 monitors from around 40 different countries. Two-thirds of those monitors are based in the East. The SMM has shown its ability and willingness to increase its presence. However, the monitoring teams must also be provided with unrestricted and secure access through the conflict zone. As we have seen in Shirokina, in around Donetsk airport and other hotspots, the ceasefire remains fragile. The situation for the local population remains precarious. All sides need to exercise maximum restraint and fully assume their responsibility to further displacement and suffering and to redouble their efforts to reach a political settlement. As you know, the SMM has been diligently working on localized initiatives within the framework of means arrangements. In Shirokina last week, the SMM facilitated a ceasefire that lasted for over 67 hours, and the SMM had uninterrupted presence there for over 40 hours and was present in the village every day. This included an overnight static observation. The SMM stands ready to accompany, document, and provide its dialogue facilitation to the, to the sites. The Shirokina Initiative is a pilot operation which the SMM can and will duplicate in other hotspots. Only disengagement and demilitarization can bring about normalization and return to civilian logic in Shirokina. And I should add that, I should add that our efforts with regard to Shirokina is still underway. And my deputy and my people are there continuing their work with the two sides. And originally, we, may, we have made a suggestion for the withdrawal of troops from five to eight kilometers. And we want somewhat normalization or normal situation should come back to Shirokina. Shirokina is important because if we could achieve tangible results over there, we would like to apply this experience and this methodology to other hotspots, such as the vicinity of Tonis Airport and other regions. And, uh, The Permanent Council is supporting our effort. 
there is somewhat a local truth. I think uh, the people of Mariupol is suffering. They look for help. They look our 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 initiative to achieve a local ceasefire. I mean, and as well as you know, withdrawal of troops that will sponsor this ceasefire regime. And we are in the process of increasing the number of our monitors and also as well as technical staff which would be helpful, who would be helpful for upgrading our technological capabilities such as satellite imagery, drones and other uh, electronic uh, instruments including uh, new and modern radar systems because the area is a huge uh, the length of the ceasefire is about 487 kilometers and the width of this area according to the range of the missiles and heavy weapons uh, nearly 140 kilometers. This is the reason I'm defining this area as a huge area. And uh, you will recall that uh, the normal, normal format also asked the parties to withdraw all tanks, artillery cannons, and other type of heavy weapons as well. So this is a something new language to the means in the context of it, its implementation. Be sure that we will be working for the implementation of means process, means process and means package or means documents are all inter integrated and interconnected to each other and we hope any move in that direction will bring a new atmosphere to the region. At the moment the situation is precarious, tense, if could achieve some type of local truces that will decrease the level of tension and that will be a support to the political process. Our planning is, maybe I could take one or two questions, then my spokesman will take the others. Any uh, questions? Albert RT, DPA, Chairman Press Agency. I have a question about the, uh, increasing the numbers of monitors because in your uh, full uh, report, on one hand, you say until the issue of uh, full access is resolved, additional monitors will have little impact on monitoring the Minsk packages. On the other hand, you're saying you're increasing the number of monitors. Why are you increasing the number of monitors? Because uh, the you know, two things are connected. We need full access. We need security. And I will repeat, unhindered access to all regions. This will increase our capacity to observe. Also, the number, to the extent number is being increased, this will also increasing our capacity. So. Uh, it's not only the number issue, but also access and unhindered access. I'm sorry, I'm not sure uh, my question was understood. Yes, would you repeat it? Um, you say in your full report that it makes no sense to increase the numbers of observers unless there is full access. On the other hand, you're saying you're increasing the numbers, so that there is a contradiction. Could you please explain that contradiction? What is what you repeat the question? Yeah, so, so um, we say we, we can't increase the numbers unless we have full access. Yeah. So why do we need to increase the numbers if we yet don't, do not have? Well, there is not a conditionality. I'm not sure about what it has been. It's not a conditionality. In a broad sense and in our vision, 
the area is a big. We need more monitors in order to control remote areas, to, to, to go to, to hotspots. And we moved also into high profile areas. Almost uh, we are present uh, for three, four hours every day in three, four high profile areas. One of them is in Shurkina. So uh, we have sectors on the front line and we are adapting ourselves to the new emerging realities in the war zone. But it's also critically important to us in order to make a sound observation, we have to be there. At the end of the day, we are, our people are somewhat civilian food soldiers. They have to go there and check with other observations provided by the technological capabilities. What I'm trying to say, any improvement in access will increase our capacity to observe. But in the meantime, we have to prepare our teams and increase their numbers, train them, and adapt ourselves to the frontline realities. Bethany Bell, BBC. The United States has accused Russia of deploying more air defense systems uh, in eastern Ukraine and also training separatist forces there. Have your monitors seen any evidence backing that up? Well, I have to say that our monitors, this is not a direct reply to your question because uh, I don't want to be, you know, this is, uh, I don't want to be a part of a political debate or discussion. My job is to have our monitors present all around Ukraine. Two-thirds of them in eastern Ukraine. But we have to cover also the western sides. And in that respect, whatever we have seen, they are reflected on our reports with objectivity and impartiality. So if you can look at our reports, I don't want to add anything to our reports because our reports are considered the opinion of the mission. We are studying all the findings of teams, even from our patrol hubs from remote areas. We are checking with them again and again. We are analyzing them and making them as a report and we are submitting to the permanent council. So I will not anything to the reportings we have done. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Michael will stay here and he will be ready for further questions. Thank you. Um, if I could just add some detail there as well. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, there is also replenishment issues involved too because, um, as you know, the mission's mandate was extended by a year. Some people originally only signed on for a year. So, uh, and as you also know, um, two-thirds uh, of the monitors are now in eastern Ukraine, so there's a need to replenish our numbers in western Ukraine as well. So. Uh, the numbers um, also will need to come back up to where we were just a few weeks ago, so th hence the call for more monitors to participating states. Hello, sir. Michael, on this, uh, the, the Shirokino plan, the, this truce plan, could you please specify exactly kind of what, what are the, the details of that plan that the SMM is working on? Yeah, like five to eight kilometers mm -hmm. to each side, the overnight observation. And like, if you could list, list the points of what, what the plan consists of and where does it stand now? Okay. Yeah, the, well, the longer statement that we had prepared, is, it gives a bit more uh, detail in that. Um, so what we've been working on in places like uh, Shurokan, as the ambassador, ambassador said, are what we call localized initiatives but of course within the framework of, of the Minsk arrangement. So these include local ceasefire facilitation, facilitation of access for humanitarian aid, facilitation of access for demining, and facilitation um, to, for example, recover killed civilians, for, uh, usually with the uh, cooperation of the ICRC. Now, 
Again, what happened in Shirokal, and I'm getting to your question, Shirokal last week is the SMM facilitated a ceasefire that lasted for over 67 hours. That's a, a long time in the current... Six, six seven, yeah. That's a long time in the um, current environment. And um, we had an uninterrupted presence there for over uh, 40 hours in, in the village every day. And as the ambassador mentioned, that included, no, included an overnight static observation. Um, I'll go on in a second, but just on the overnight observation, um, I, I can give you a bit of background on this, but it, it, it's very, very different from daytime observation. You need special training, you need special equipment, uh, night vision equipment, things like that. And there are also security issues uh, that are involved, for example, um, extraction if there is a problem of, of patrol uh, members can be more difficult, of course, at nighttime. So, we're going about this uh, very carefully, looking at all angles of it, um, you know, before it's, it's uh, replicated in, on a wider basis. Um, as for the disengagement plan that has been proposed in Shiroka, now this is from April 9th, is the proposal suggested the withdrawal of all arms uh, formations away from Shirokana to at least five to eight kilometers. Um, and the withdrawal of all, all heavy weaponry in line with the Minsk arrangements. The reason this um, kilometrage, if I can put it that way, was selected is it puts certain heavy weaponry out of range, I believe 200 or 122 millimeter out of range of each other. So um, th that's the reason for that. Um, and then we, we are, we're also saying that, um, you know, we're very keen to see this disengagement happen because the sides have to, and in order for that to happen, the sides have to finalize the demilitarization plan and implement it uh, quickly. Only disengagement and demilitarization can bring about normalization and return to civilian logic in Shirokane. We, As the ambassador mentioned, um, the deputy chief monitor is back in Shirokane. They spent quite a lot of time there in the past uh, two to three weeks. Um, and it's a very complicated situation. Um, the, after that period of time that I mentioned that there was an unbroken ceasefire, the ceasefire was broken. Um, there's also, not only there, but uh, in and around Donetsk airport, as you would have seen from our reports, uh, still quite a bit of heavy weaponry around. Um, and um, Ambassador, the uh, Permanent Council meeting just now did talk about the process of withdrawal of, of heavy weaponry. Uh, there's still a lot of uh, work to be done in that regard, including um, provision of more information on what exactly exists. And as I've said before to you, the, we need to know more about the routes that they're planning to use to withdraw and also the storage points. Uh, finally, um, in the reports, you will see that there have been uh, instances where heavy weaponry was parked, was meant to be <laughs> stayed there, but uh, then our monitors came back and it's been moved. Um, so that situation continues for the time being. Please. <clears throat> and this is a follow-up question about the uh, possible presence of Russian troops. Uh, what I have understood is that OSC till now can cannot uh, confirm or deny the presence of Russian troops. Is that what, uh, what would you describe the situation now? What, what we have seen over the past months are uh, convoys of uh, uh, unidentified convoys, unmarked convoys moving uh, in and around the conflict zone, uh, especially this is going back to late last year towards uh, Donetsk. Um, there was uh, one or two occasions where they may have had a flag or something like that, but uh, these are unmarked convoys, and uh, on many occasions they were uh, towing heavy weaponry from the 122 millimeter howitzers to multiple rocket launch systems. And as I said at my media briefing in Kiev more than once, is that we go as far as we can um, visually to identify the convoys, right, right down to the make of the vehicles. Um, so um, it's up to others to perhaps draw conclusions and, and take decisions, but uh, um, you know, the, we, we do what we can in order to identify as much as we can with our own ears and eyes in terms of the movement of these um, unmarked uh, convoys and unmarked individuals. Well, of 
that's it. <laughs> um, we, um, again, reminder, um, if I can, uh, just use this opportunity, aside from the um, daily reports uh, that are coming out, we're also, um, I can say, boosting our, the visibility of our thematic reports. In fact, we just came out with one. It is on the website in three languages about the um, withdrawal of state support to institutions in the, uh, in the Donbass region, in the uh, area controlled um, by the rebels. And uh, there'll be another one out um, in the next few days about uh, the freedom of access issues, uh, because as you know, there is a permit, permit system in place. It's been in place quite some time. And uh, this has uh, impacted upon the ability of people to move in and out of the um, conflict zone, to uh, resupply themselves with essential goods, to seek, to seek medical aid, that sort of thing. So we're going to um, have a formal launch of these reports henceforth. Um, we're going to have uh, background media briefings on them, uh, press releases, that sort of thing, because these are flagship uh, reports from the mission and they involve a lot of detail and um, some analysis and recommendations. Also in the works, not to bore you too much, I hope, is a um, uh, survey we've done on the media landscape in Ukraine. Uh, very interesting findings there, as you might imagine, um, especially in eastern Ukraine two areas there. You have, for example, um, in um, uh, Sovyansk and Kamartovsk, uh, you have areas which were, uh, which the rebels did um, have control over for a while. And the media outlets that we visited, that we talked to there, suffered significantly in terms of destruction of equipment, in terms of uh, people uh, being um, forced to flee, journalists being forced to flee. And uh, then also in the uh, areas still controlled by the rebels, it's a completely different situation, as you might imagine, from a year ago, uh, where most of the existing media outlets um, have been closed down um, and replaced with uh, very propagandistic type of channels. So um, I think you, as journalists, you'll find that one quite a bit of interest. We'll try to get it out as soon as possible. Yes, sir. You're going to ask about vehicles, right? Yeah, <laughs> I want to like, yeah, the, the question that I sent to you yesterday, mm -hmm. could you follow up on that? Is there any, anything, any of substance? The question was about the allegations from the, uh, from the DNR that uh, there was an episode <coughs> supposedly registered by the Joint Center for Control and Coordination, and we only know that from the, from the DNR, where there were two vehicles marked uh, similarly to OSCE, uh, somehow registered with the Ukrainian forces carrying out an attack. So, kind of, I was trying to ask Michael whether there is any confirmation of that, if there is any investigation of that, etc. Yeah, we're we're looking. Thanks for that. We're looking at our logs and so on, and where our vehicles were at the time cited. But I don't have anything further on that specific one. But what I can tell you is because. There have been a lot of questions. I know my colleagues in Vienna have been getting them about um, photographs of our vehicles that have appeared on social media. What, uh, autographs? Photographs. Photographs, ah, yes. Mm -hmm. That have appeared on social media. And um, we do remind people that, well, two things. One is that there are at least two vehicles out there that were um, taken away, stolen, however you want to put it, during that time when our colleagues were uh, kidnapped for a month uh, last year. Um, secondly, um, there does seem to be at least uh, one vehicle um, roaming around, uh, which uh, it's a Lexus vehicle. We don't have any in our fleet, which has OSC uh, logo on it. This is um, unauthorized use of the logo. It's unacceptable. There are security issues involved when uh, people do that. So, of course, we're in touch with uh, Ukrainian uh, and relevant authorities about that to find these vehicles and you know, have those logos remo removed. Uh, because it does um, cause a lot of uh, confusion. Again, it causes security issues, and uh, we take those very seriously. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, it was Alexis. So and two, it was in two, cars were two, stolen? two were stolen during the kidnapping episode. Correct, yeah. It was last year. Right? Last year, yeah. last summer. Uh huh. So they were, people were returning the vehicles. Well, these were, were the returned. vehicles that the um, colleagues were in at the time when they were taken away. Uh huh. So the um, people who did that decided to keep the vehicles. Um, uh huh. Okay. Although 
I suspect by now they're not in very good shape. Uh, yeah, so the requests were, if I'm not mistaken, were put out to have these returned, but they weren't, so. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And cluster is one Lexus that's like a... It's a Dnipropetrovsk. Okay, yeah. in Dnipropetrovsk. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, thanks very much. Always a pleasure to, to be with you guys. Okay, thanks.